If you were trapped on board a cargo ship with a genetically engineered super soldier on a rampage, what would you do? This experiment gone wrong is a modern day Frankenstein's monster, and on this boat, there's more than one passenger with a secret to hide. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Alpha in Project Wolf Hunting. This group of detectives have no idea that the convicts aren't the only monsters on board. At a dock in the Philippines, Chief Lee Sok Woo and his team of over 20 veteran detectives wait for a transport bus to arrive. The bus holds a large group of Korean fugitives, including two Red Notice individuals, who must be extradited back to Korea by cargo ship due to recent attacks making it unsafe to travel by plane. The bus arrives, and the fugitives get off one by one, while the chief checks them off the list. Park Jung-woo, one of the Red Notice criminals who's covered in tattoos, taunts the chief, who then violently beats him up in front of everyone showing that he clearly doesn't care about their rights. While they're getting ready to board, civilian doctor Sun Tzu Troll and his nurse arrive to replace the police doctor, who cancelled at the last minute. The detectives load the criminals on board the ship, the frontier titan, and their cruise from hell begins. In the port office in Busan, South Korea, head of special operations Oh Dae Woong arrives and kicks out the employees, telling them that his team is taking over all operations regarding the frontier titan. His team gets to work setting up their equipment, while Dae Woong looks over a classified dossier titled Project Wolf Hunting. Back on the boat, the detectives load the fugitives into their cells and cuff them to pipes attached to the walls. They read them their arrest warrants and their rights under South Korean law. The two female fugitives are taken to a separate room by two female detectives and restrained in the same fashion. Chief Sok Woo prepares the fugitives for the trip and warns them that there's no place to escape. He instructs the rest of the detectives to watch them in shifts and never let anyone out of their sight. Later in the kitchen, the detectives prepare the night's meals for the fugitives. The chief heads to bed for the night and the chief ship leaves port. While the nurse loads blood bags into the fridge, Dr. Sun steals syringes and other medical supplies and stashes them in a paper bag. He gets on the elevator, making sure he isn't watched. On his way down, he looks over blueprints of the ship. He arrives in the maintenance area and sneaks his way around the employees working there until he comes to a door with a big red button. He presses it twice and the door opens to let him in. He walks deeper into the engine room until he runs into a shady looking man who's not dressed like an employee. They walk over to a workstation where a mysterious body in a prison jumpsuit lies strapped down by rebar and attached to an oxygen machine. The doctor removes the mask, noticing that the body's eyes are stapled shut and its mouth is full of maggots. Dr. Sun doesn't know it yet, but he's looking at Alpha, a genetically engineered zombie super soldier secretly being transported on board the ship by pharmaceutical company Aeon Genetics. He's freaked out, but he injects the body with anesthesia and places the mask back on. Upstairs, Jong Du spits out a lockpick that he's been hiding in his mouth and begins working to free himself from his cuffs. In a few moments, he breaks out of his cuffs and throws the tool to his cellmate. Meanwhile, a group of criminals who are pretending to be maintenance men meet up in the hallway and let themselves into a locked room where they pry open a crate full of weapons and tactical gear. They exit the room and a group of detectives on break notice their guns. Suddenly, the hijackers violently attack these men and kill them all. They hide the bodies in the kitchen freezer and then go for the bridge. The hijackers burst onto the bridge and shoot the captain and most of the crew, leaving only two alive to steer the ship. That makes one victim down with 13 more to go. They cut the wires for the ship's tracking equipment and destroy the emergency phone so that the crew won't be able to call for help. Jung Ju's cellmate gets himself free, but knocks his cuffs against the pipe, making a loud noise that alerts one of the cops. The detective comes to see what's going on, and when he has his back turned, Jung Ju attacks him, strangling him and biting off his ear. Just then, the hijackers break into the hallway and attack the detectives as well. A huge riot breaks out, but the criminals are able to overpower the detectives and escape. Okay, this situation is already bad, and the detectives haven't even found out about the seven-foot-tall zombie that's hiding with the luggage. The first sign that something is bound to go wrong is the national news report covering the exact details of the trip. The chief comments that he thought the mission was classified, but it seems like somehow the word got out. Everyone in the country now knows the name of the ship, what port they're leaving out of, and even how many detectives will be on board, which is all very helpful information to have if you're a bad guy planning a breakout. After the attacks on the last extradition trip, I would be very careful to keep the details of our mission a secret, but it seems like someone hasn't heard that loose lips sink ships. The report mentions that there will be two particularly dangerous red notice fugitives on board, but what exactly does this mean? 
The International Criminal Police Organization, commonly known as Interpol, is an international organization that connects police forces around the world and offers them support in fighting crime. A red notice is an alert sent to all Interpol member countries for the arrest of a particular fugitive. It contains information to help identify the wanted person, such as their physical description, name and birthday, as well as information about the crime they are wanted for. Most red notice criminals are wanted for violent crimes, human trafficking, or crimes against children. So if a criminal commits a crime in South Korea, but then flees the country, South Korean authorities can request that Interpol issue a red notice and the criminal be arrested if caught by police in any member country and extradited back to South Korea to stand a trial. Many criminals see being moved as a perfect time to make their escape, so security during transportation is taken extremely seriously. Officers are specifically trained to look out for convicts smuggling small objects like paper clips, which can be used to pick the locks of handcuffs, exactly how Jong Du ends up getting out of his. If you're paying attention when the chief and Jong Ju have their friendly reunion, it looks like his upper lip is sitting weirdly high on his teeth, totally giving away the fact that he's hiding something in his mouth. Maybe if the chief had spent more time searching the convicts and less time committing acts of police brutality, he could have stopped this hijacking before it ever began. Also, if you're about to get on a boat with dangerous convicts who outnumber your crew two to one, it might not be the best idea to beat their leader up in front of them. There are plenty of ways to put Jong Du in his place without escalating things to the point of physical violence, such as putting him in additional restraints or solitary confinement, and being able to keep your composure despite the taunting could make you seem that much more intimidating. The chief might be trying to show the prisoners who the real alpha male on board is, but he has no idea of the biological horror that's lurking below deck. Although many of these convicts are considered extremely dangerous, the detectives are fatally lax when it comes to restraining them. Even the Red Notice fugitives are only secured with handcuffs, making it extremely easy for Zhang Du to escape. At minimum, I would have fitted the convicts with handcuff covers to prevent them from tampering with the locks. If we've taken over an entire cargo ship and hired a team of more than 20 veteran detectives for the mission, it just doesn't make any sense to cut quarters when it comes to security. I'm sure the officers were properly instructed in safe prisoner transport at the academy, but I guess for some of them, that lesson went in one ear and out the other. Now, if the doctor for the mission cancels and has to be replaced at the last minute, it's time to get suspicious. And if you are that replacement doctor and you've been secretly hired to sedate a real-life Frankenstein's monster, it's time to seriously reevaluate your career choices. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A shady pharmaceutical company tries to smuggle a human bioweapon on board a cargo ship. He escapes, and everyone dies. The end. I know med school's expensive, but you couldn't cut a check big enough to get me on that boat. Everyone thinks this time the zombie super soldier will behave himself until he's ripping out throats and devouring brains. Maybe next time Dr. Sun should read the fine print before he takes a job babysitting any man-made horrors beyond his comprehension. The hijackers set the rest of their friends free, including criminal Go Gun Bay and the suspiciously quiet Red Notice fugitive Lee Do Il. Jong Do recognizes Do Il and says it doesn't look like he's aged a day in 10 years. Do Il asks Jong Do what he's doing, and he says breaking them out. But Do Il thinks it's a bad idea and says they need to go to Korea, although nobody else agrees with him. Jong Do takes a group of fugitives down to the engine room while Gun Bae cleans up the bodies and then goes to get his girlfriend Myung Ju, one of the female criminals on board. Jong Do here warns anyone who doesn't want to help him to stay out of his way. Meanwhile, female detective Lee Dae Yeon realizes that she has no internet connection and and calls for backup on her walkie-talkie. Nobody answers, so she decides to look for the captain. Dae-yeon walks around the ship looking for her fellow detectives and runs into Dr. Sun sneaking upstairs. Above her, the chief appears with two detectives, also looking into the cause for the loss of signal. Suddenly, they notice one of the fugitives climbing down from the communications tower and realize that a mutiny is underway. They go to check it out, leaving the doctor behind. Dae-yeon, the chief, and two other detectives make it to the bridge and immediately get in a huge shootout with the fugitives there. The hijackers fire at them indiscriminately with machine guns and quickly take out one of the detectives and one of their own friends. The chief returns fire, but the criminals have them totally pinned down. Dayon shoots one of the fugitives in the leg, and the chief finishes him off, leaving just the guy with the machine gun to deal with. He runs out of ammo but gets up and holds one of the crew hostage, telling the detectives to drop their guns. The chief puts his weapon on the floor and comes out with his hands up, but while the fugitive is distracted, Dayon jumps over the counter and tackles him away from the hostage. They fight and he starts to choke her, but she breaks free, and the chief shoots and kills him. Dayon asks the surviving worker where she can find a way to contact Korea, and he tells her that there's a phone in the engine room, but she has no no idea that Jong Du and his crew are already on their way down there. The chief and Dae Yeon get to the hallway where they were keeping the fugitives and see that everyone has escaped. They meet up with another team of detectives and decide to go as a group to check out the engine room. 
Dr. Son gets back to his medical bay and finds the nurse there having a beer. He's convinced that he heard gunshots and the nurse wants to go check, but he locks the door and sits in a chair in front of it so that she can't leave and no one can get in. Gunbei and his team of convicts load the dead bodies into the freezer. So much blood goes down the drain that it starts to leak out of the pipes in the engine room below and drips down to Alpha waking him up. Now, the real monster is about to break loose. Jong Du and his crew arrive at the engine room and immediately start killing the workers. He asks one of the workers where the phone is and sends two of his men with a hostage up to the engine control room to take it out. They brutally kill the workers they find there and destroy the phone so that there's no chance of anyone calling for help before returning to the engine room. Jong Du tries to kill the last crewmate, but Do Il stops him, catching his arm at the last second. Just then, the detectives arrive and fire warning shots right by them, but the crewmate warns them not to shoot, or they'll damage the engine and the boat will be stuck. Jong Du says let's have some fun, and they all get ready for a hand-to-hand -hand brawl, but not before the chief engineer is executed. That makes two victims down, with 12 more to go. Jong Du lunges at the police chief with a knife, but he knocks it out of his hand, and a bloody battle begins. Many detectives and fugitives are killed in the chaos, and one criminal tries to escape, but suddenly Alpha jumps down right in front of them. Alpha kicks him in the chest so hard that it sends him flying across the room, killing him instantly, and showing that the creature has super strength. The fight stops for a moment as the detectives and fugitives all stare in horror at the monster, while he surveys them with thermal vision. Alpha walks slowly towards them, taking the knife from the first fugitive who attacks him, before quickly slashing his throat and ripping a hole in his chest. Alpha rampages around the room killing person after person, and there is nothing that anybody can do to stop him. One fugitive tries to run, but Alpha chases him down and rips open the back of his head. Jong Du and his crew see this as their moment to escape. He fires at Alpha with a machine gun from upstairs, but misses every shot, only succeeding to get his attention. Alpha bounds up the stairs to them in just a few steps, and takes out Jong Du's last two friends. Jong Du fires at Alpha with his machine machine gun and hits him a few times, but Alpha's totally unfazed. Jong Du realizes that he's doomed, and Alpha slowly walks towards him, dragging a sledgehammer along the ground. Alpha strikes him in the side, knocking him into the engine equipment, and then pummels him in the head over and over again with the sledgehammer, all without saying a word. That makes three victims down with 11 more to go. The blood from Jong Du's body shorts out the engine, and the cargo ship stops dead in the water. Okay, this pirate cruise just went from yo-ho to oh no, faster than you can say genetically engineered zombie super soldier. Compared to being massacred by a walking corpse, maybe prison wouldn't have been so bad after all. Daeyeon has a feeling that something is unright when she catches the doctor coming up from the basement. The trip only just started, so Dr. Sun should have plenty of work to do getting things ready in the medical bay instead of taking a self-guided tour of the maintenance areas. Even if he noticed the internet was down, why not send his nurse to go check it out instead of going himself? That way, he would be at his post in case of any medical emergencies. Dr. Sun is suspicious, and I would have had a lot more questions for him if it wasn't for the ongoing mutiny demanding more immediate attention. Before they know it, Daeyeon and the chief find themselves in the middle of a full-blown hijacking, complete with ruthless pirates and high-powered machine guns. They're outnumbered, outgunned, and out in the middle of the ocean, not exactly a position that you want to be in. At this point, I think it's safe to say that things are no longer under their control. Daeyeon and the chief decide to hastily assault the bridge, which ends up getting one of their own detectives killed, only for them to find out that they can't use the phone there anyway. The smarter thing to do would have been to find somewhere to hold out and wait for backup. The Frontier Titan is a massive cargo ship carrying extremely dangerous criminals, so even if the communication lines are cut, you can be sure that authorities should be on their way pretty quickly at the first sign of something going wrong. Why get into a shootout yourself when you could just wait for the military to show up and send them all to Davy Jones' locker? Down in the engine room, the detectives aren't able to use their guns since they don't want to damage the engine equipment. If they're going to get things under control, they'll have to do so fighting hand to hand, which would be a great time to have some riot gear. To deal with prison riots, corrections officers use a variety of protective equipment and non-lethal weapons, which this crew inexplicably seems to have none of. Some helmets and shields alone would have given the detectives a massive upper hand in the brawl, and they may have actually gotten things back under control. That is, until Alpha showed up. Now, when a genetically enhanced berserker shows up and starts kicking people across the room, you really only have one option if you want to survive. Get out of there as fast as you possibly can. It's obvious that fighting him one-on-one -on -one is going to be impossible, and doing anything other than running for your life at this point is just going to get you killed. Jong Du must have had a pretty big head to think he could take on Alpha and win, but something tells me that he won't be having that problem anymore. The lights go out, and Daeyeon, the chief, and Do Il try to collect their thoughts. Suddenly, Alpha grabs the chief just as the lights turn back on. 
Doel picks up a knife and lunges at Alpha, causing him to drop the chief. As Doel slices at Alpha, he notices a POW patch sewn to his chest. While Alpha is distracted, Dayun grabs the injured chief and makes a run for it. Alpha throws Doel aside and jumps after them, slicing the chief several times. Doel catches up and Alpha starts to choke him, but Dayun shoots him through the arm. Alpha drops Doel and Dayun shoots him again in the shoulder, but he takes the hit and pulls the bullet out himself, looking like he hardly felt a thing. The group runs through the automatic door, but Alpha catches up to them, holding it open with his super strength. Doel kicks him in the chest, knocking him back and showing that he's also extremely strong. Alpha quickly recovers and stands up zombie-like, but the door closes just in time. The survivors make their way upstairs and the old convict notices that the jumpsuit Alpha was wearing isn't even from this century. At the control center in Korea, the special ops team finally gets pictures of the ship for the first time since they lost communications. The special ops chief can tell from the pictures that the ship was hijacked. He gets a call from his boss saying that he needs to take a nearby helicopter and go get Alpha himself immediately. The man is furious and punches a hole in a nearby electrical panel showing that he has super strength as well. Back on the ship, two of the crewmates try to escape in the lifeboat, but suddenly a dead body falls down right in front of this guy. Alpha jumps out and violently kills them both. And the infirmary, the nurse hears a noise outside and looks out of the window to investigate. She notices that the lifeboat is unlatched and blowing around in the storm. Suddenly, Alpha busts his hand through the glass and rips out her throat, killing her. That makes four victims down with 10 more to go. He peers in at the doctor upside down and the doctor panics and runs for his life, sprinting down the hallway and right into Daeyeon and Do-il. The chief grabs him and asks him what's going on. And that's when Dr. Sun reveals that he was hired by pharmaceutical company Aeon Genetics to inject Alpha with an anesthetic every six hours. Dr. Sun says that the people in the basement will know more and that they can also get medical supplies down there for the hurt old man. The chief sends Dayon down to the basement with the rest of the group while he goes alone to check for any other survivors. Okay, Frankenstein's monster just turned this boat into his personal hunting ground and he's going open season on anyone who crosses his path. The detectives don't know exactly what they're dealing with yet, but since they've survived their first encounter with Alpha, they may have noticed a few things that can help them come up with a plan to defeat him. The POW patch sewn to his chest and century-old jumpsuit combined with his incredible strength and zombie-like behavior indicate to me that Alpha is some sort of undead super soldier. He's impervious to damage and shooting him isn't going to get the job done. So if you want to defeat him, you're going to need to get creative. We don't have any word on his weaknesses yet, but there are a few guaranteed ways to take out a creature like Alpha if you're able to pull them off. Even if it can't be damaged in traditional ways, completely destroying his head or body, dismembering him, or lighting him on fire usually does the trick. Doing any of this, however, is going to require quite a bit of force and personal risk, and there may be a more elegant solution for those of us who've been paying close attention. When the chief and Dayon interrogate the doctor, he mentions that he was hired to administer a sedative to Alpha every six hours. Now, if they could get their hands on some of that sedative, all they need to do is hit Alpha with a massive dose of it to put him right back to sleep. It wouldn't be easy. But using teamwork, you might be able to lure Alpha into a trap and then nail him with some sleep juice. Once he's down, you can decide if you want to turn him back over to his shady pharmaceutical company handlers or finally lay this demon to rest for the good of society. Dr. Sun leads the group to the engine room and when they get there, they see that the door is open. They sneak in cautiously and find the dead bodies of the two shady workers violently killed by Alpha when he woke up. Dr. Sun prepares some medical supplies and starts to help the old man with his wounds. Dayon asks Doyle if he needs any help, but he seems fine, even though he was definitely hurt in the fight with Alpha. Looking around the lab, Dayon finds classified documents written in Japanese that contain information about Alpha. It says that he was forced into the Japanese army in 1943 and lost his arm in battle. He became a test subject for a top secret military project and earned a double A distinction in the human weapon category. Dr. Sun finds a laptop that reveals even more. He reads that Alpha's extreme violence is a side effect of genetic hybridization and PTSD from exposure to constant overwhelming pain. Alpha reacts to threatening movement and changes in his target's temperature. It has several genetic traits of a wolf, including extreme sensitivity to sound, a heightened sense of smell, and the strength of five adult men. He says that Alpha's cells don't show any signs associated with biological aging, which is why Aon Pharmaceuticals plans to use him in their anti-aging science. Meanwhile, Gunbei goes to get his girlfriend, Myungju. As they're getting ready to leave, the two fugitives standing guard outside of the room notice the heavy steel door at the end of the hall start to shake. One of the fugitives goes to investigate and suddenly Alpha kicks the entire door down right on top of it. Alpha slowly walks across the door and then steps right on the fugitive's head, crushing him while the others watch. Another convict tries to stab Alpha, but he knocks him across the room, killing him instantly. 
Alpha pulls the knife from his side and lunges towards the tied up officer, stabbing her in the throat and turning around to deal with the rest of the room. That makes five victims down with nine more to go. One of the fugitives fires his gun at Alpha while Gunbei and Myungju escape, but Alpha cuts his legs off at the knees with one swift slice. Alpha leaps out into the hallway and grabs the other female fugitive, slamming her against the wall and pinning her up with a knife Michael Myers style. Gunbei and Myungju run, and Alpha picks up a gun before following them. Moments later, the chief comes across the scene of the massacre in the hallway. He cautiously looks around holding his gun, but Alpha is gone and everyone there is already dead. Gunbei and Myungju quickly get in the elevator, but just as it starts to move, Alpha jumps down on it from above. They try desperately to get out, but the door won't open, and Alpha fires at them through the roof of the elevator until he runs out of ammo, fraying the cables in the process. He stomps down the elevator roof repeatedly, eventually creating a hole and peering through right at Gunbei and Myungju. Alpha grabs Gunbei by the shoulder and violently pulls him up through the hole in the elevator roof. Just then, the chief comes running and opens the elevator door, rescuing Myungju just as Alpha drops down through the ceiling. Alpha tries to chase after them, but Gunbei grabs him and slows him down. Alpha turns around and breaks his neck, and suddenly the cables snap, setting the elevator crashing down to the basement. That makes six victims down with eight more to go. The chief looks down the shaft and sees Alpha staring up at him, so he takes Myungju and gets out of there. Okay, every relationship has its ups and downs, but this is just ridiculous. Gunbei and Myungju probably had a lovely convict couple's cruise planned, but it looks like it just got cut tragically short. Now that Daeyeon has found Alpha's secret files, she's armed with a lot more knowledge that will come in handy during their next fight. Alpha here is technically a genetically engineered zombie super soldier from the Second World War. His genes are spliced with those of a wolf to give him a heightened sense of hearing and smell, as well as superhuman strength and agility. He's also impervious to damage, can detect threatening movements, and sees in thermal vision like the Predator. So yeah, not a guy you want coming after you, but watch the science behind this. It may sound like pure science fiction, but pharmaceuticals pharmaceutical companies have actually been splicing human and animal DNA to create genetically modified life forms for many years already, and that's just what they'll tell us. While they aren't creating half-human, half-wolf super soldiers yet, scientists have used mice spliced with human DNA to study our immune system, and even experiment with injecting human cells into pig embryos in the hopes of one day growing human organs for transplant. Militaries around the world have been experimenting with gene editing technology to enhance the capabilities of their soldiers, although the technology is still in its early days. The United States military has invested millions of dollars in developing software that can be directly uploaded to the human brain, heightening the soldier's senses and making them resistant to blindness and paralysis. Military scientists have long wanted to explore the possibilities of editing the genes of their adult soldiers, but with current technology, it is much easier to alter genes in an embryo although the practice is considered unethical. CRISPR technology involves using a specific sequence of genes to target and remove other sequences of genes, thereby removing undesirable traits or even possibly adding desirable ones. This technology does exist today, and if Aeon Genetics had made significant advancements, it's not impossible for a creation such as Alpha to exist. In terms of his powers, being genetically spliced with wolf DNA would give Alpha many significant advantages in a fight. Wolves are extremely fast and agile, capable of running at speeds of nearly 40 miles per hour, and some larger breeds of dogs can easily surpass a human in strength. While wolves can't see in infrared, they do possess specially evolved sight that allows them to see in low light conditions and perceive movements more easily. The tip of a wolf's nose is covered in nerve endings that can sense heat sources, allowing them to hunt in low visibility, and this could explain Alpha Alpha's ability to see in thermal vision. So, now that we understand a bit about Alpha, how do we fight back and get out of here alive? Alpha has wolf DNA and is over a century old, so he might just be very hungry. Instead of fighting him, giving him some meat from the kitchen might be enough to distract him or even make him your friend. When people need to give their dogs medicine, sometimes it works to hide it in their food. So this could also be a chance to slip Alpha some sedatives and put him back to sleep. If you had wolf genetics and haven't had a hot meal in a hundred years, you'd probably scarf down a nice burger in an instant. So I'd incorporate this into my strategy. We also know that Alpha is extremely sensitive to sound and smells, and this is definitely something that can be used against him. Repeated loud noises like smashing pots and pans together might stun Alpha or even cause him to run in fear. Next time he showed up, you could use loud sounds to distract or stun him and hopefully open him up for a counterattack. His sensitivity to smells could also be used in a similar way. It's not a pretty thought, but perhaps if you could make yourself overwhelmingly stinky, Alpha wouldn't want to come after you. 
there are bound to be many offensive smelling substances on board the ship, and this might be something else that you could use to your advantage. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and I might even burst a waste disposal pipe in one of the hallways if I thought it might serve as a makeshift olfactory barrier. If it smells bad to you, just imagine how bad it would smell to Alpha with his heightened senses. Is it the most glorious plan? Absolutely not, but it just might save your life. Since Alpha has the genetics of a wolf and reacts to threatening movement, the last thing you want to do is run, because that's what Prey does, and he's definitely fast enough to catch you. So far, everyone has tried to either fight Alpha or run from him, and neither option has worked. He's incredibly intimidating, but something nobody has tried yet is just standing their ground in a non-threatening way. The poor guy even has PTSD from quote, constant overwhelming pain, so maybe just being nice to him would do the trick. He's obviously on edge, and after being turned into a genetic experiment against his will, who could blame him? Sometimes even Frankenstein's monster just needs a hug. Alpha may be impervious to physical damage, but Gunbei and Myungju probably hurt his feelings when they wouldn't make room for him in the elevator. And when an undead super soldier throws a temper tantrum, you do not want to be in his way. The chief and Myungju run to the kitchen and lock themselves in, opening the freezer and finding all the dead bodies of the crew. They hear a noise behind them, and the chief puts Myungju in the freezer, telling her to hide and stay quiet. The chief walks around the kitchen with his gun drawn, looking for the source of the noise, when suddenly Alpha kicks the door down. The chief fires at him, but Alpha agilely leaps over the counter and punches him in the chest. He grabs the chief and throws him across the room, toying with him. The chief grabs the knife and stabs Alpha in the arm. Alpha knocks the knife away, but the chief dodges his punch again and chomps into Alpha's arm with his teeth. The super soldier bashes him several times on the head, but the chief is able to hold on just long enough to completely bite Alpha's arm off at the elbow. Alpha looks at him for a moment, stunned but otherwise unhurt, and then kicks the chief in the head, breaking his neck. That makes seven victims down with seven more to go. Alpha notices Myungju watching him from the freezer and opens the door to look for her. He rubs his bloody hand across her face and crouches down right next to her, smelling her, but gets distracted by the sounds of the incoming helicopter at the last second and decides to leave. Myungju can't hold her breath any longer and gasps for air. Luckily, Alpha is gone. Okay, he put up one hell of a fight, but I think it's safe to say that in the end, the chief bit off a little more than he could chew. Taking on Alpha in the kitchen actually presents a number of opportunities to get one over on him, and if the chief had thought just a bit more creatively, he might have been able to make it out alive. The freezer is a great place to hide from Alpha's thermal vision, although getting your body temperature that low for more than just a few moments could be dangerous and potentially fatal. In a pinch, hiding in the freezer like Myungju could get Alpha off of your trail for a moment. But if you want to get rid of him for good, you're going to need to take some direct action. The many stoves around the kitchen also present a good opportunity to mess with Alpha's heat vision. Just before the fight started, the chief could have run around the kitchen lighting all the stoves, and hopefully all the heat signatures would overwhelm and confuse Alpha just long enough for you to get in a surprise attack. The kitchen should also be full of stinky food that could overpower Alpha's enhanced sense of smell. By disabling his senses, the chief could have opened up an opportunity to escape or fight back. Fighting Alpha head-on hasn't worked out for anyone so far though, so now might be the time to employ a less traditional strategy. It's a long shot, but I would have quickly dressed myself and Myungju up like waiters and sat Alpha down at a table Scooby-Doo style, making him think that I was about to serve him a three-star Michelin meal. Since I know he must be starving after over a century of being a genetic experiment, Alpha wouldn't be able to resist. Then, I'd slap a giant pot on his head while he was distracted and bang on it as hard as I could with a frying pan. The ringing would overwhelm his sensitive hearing, stunning him, and I could have my chance to escape. The chief bites into his arm like a chicken wing, and I must say it was pretty impressive even if it didn't slow Alpha down much. He's still incredibly dangerous, but having one less arm to worry about can only be a good thing. The chief took taking a bite out of crime to a whole new level, and Scruff McGruff would be proud. He put up a good fight, and now it's time for Dae Yun and Do Il to put an end to this disaster once and for all. Outside in the storm, a helicopter carrying Dae Wung and several special ops agents arrives. They all put on masks and inject themselves with the serum that causes their left eye to turn white with some sort of interface. Dr. Son and the old man hear the helicopter arrive and run for it, thinking it must be there to rescue them. Inside the ship, Myung Ju runs right into the heavily armed special forces team led by Dae Wung. She's relieved, thinking they're there to save her, but Dae Wung one casually shoots her in the head. That makes eight victims down with six more to go. Just then, Dr. Sun, the old man, Do Il, and Dae Yun run around the corner, and she draws her gun on Dae Wu, but he quickly shoots her three times in the chest, 
killing her. That makes nine victims down with five more to go. Daewing points his gun at Doil, but that's when Doil lunges towards them and instantly takes out several special agents with just his bare hands, giving Dr. Sun and the old man a chance to escape. Outside, Dr. Sun and the old man try to hijack the helicopter, but the pilot opens fire and all three of them are shot and killed. That makes 11 victims down with three more to go. Dae Wung recognizes Doel as a former criminal who was killed and then brought back to life using Aeon Genetics' experimental injection. Doel escaped from the pharmaceutical company, forcing Dae Wung to track him down and kill his family, including his infant child. Dae Wung realizes that Doel was the one who got Alpha on board this specific ship so that he could track him to Korea and eventually find the leaders of the company for his revenge. Do Il wants to know why they did this to him, but Dae Wung says that he should just be grateful for the gifts he was given. Suddenly, Alpha appears at the end of the hallway and brutally kills a special ops agent. Dae Wung orders his men to shoot Alpha, saying that all they need is the head, but Alpha pulls a massive door off its hinges and charges them using it as a shield. Dae Wung stands by and watches as Do Il and Alpha rip his entire squad to shreds. With his team down, Dae Wung laughs and kicks Alpha in the chest, sending him sliding down the hallway, and Alpha realizes that Dae Wung is super strong too. Alpha attacks Dae Wung, but he grabs him with one hand, lifting him into the air with ease, and throws him through a window into the next room. Dae Wung grabs a massive combat knife and stomps down on Alpha's back, breaking his spine. He then takes the knife and severs Alpha's ankle before holding up his head and slicing his throat. Dae Wung looks at Do Il and says now that Alpha is dead, he'll just have to bring him in instead. That makes 12 victims down with two more to go. Okay, I thought Alpha was the top dog, but Dae Wung makes him look like nothing but a sick puppy. Do Il's the only survivor, and he's secretly been out for revenge all along. Myung Ju should know that you never, and I mean never, run towards a military helicopter after you've been directly involved in an escape attempt by a top secret biological weapon. Military units that respond to these types of situations always shoot first and ask questions later, so running straight to them is only going to get you killed. In fact, I would have run in the opposite direction and taken my chances high hiding from Alpha instead of looking for help from Dae Wung and his crew. The first armed people to arrive will always be employees of the corrupt organization with orders to destroy any evidence and witnesses to cover up the event. Trust me, in a situation like this, you don't want to come out until the news cameras get there. Otherwise, you'll end up like Myung Ju. Alpha might be done for, but now Do Il has to deal with an even worse enemy. Dae Wung is clearly incredibly powerful, and taking him on in a one-on-one -on -one fight will be totally impossible for anyone who isn't a genetically enhanced super soldier. Luckily for Do Il, he happens to be one as well, and so he actually stands a fighting chance. Dae Wung is arrogant and brutal, and I would want to use this against him in the fight. Perhaps you could play against his ego in some way to get him to slip up, and then go for a critical strike while his guard was down. For example, if he thought he had you to Defeated, Dae Wung seems like the type of guy who would gloat for a minute before finishing you off. If you let him think he had won, you could go for a sneak attack while he was delivering his final monologue and take him by surprise. Even with his genetic enhancements, Do Il is going to have to think creatively if he wants to finally get his revenge. Dae Wung lunges at Do Il and the two of them get into an epic knife fight. They seem evenly matched at first, and Do Il tackles him through a door, causing them both to fall out onto the ship's deck. Do Il trips and Dae Wung jumps on top of him, stabbing him in the cheek and telling him to come quietly or he'll kill him. Do Il knocks him off and they grab each other, holding each other's arms back with knives in hand. Dae Wung taunts Do Il, saying that his child cried when he killed them, and Do Il throws him off in a rage. Do Il lands several critical stabs on Dae Wung, and he falls to his knees. But when Do Il lunges for the kill, Dae Wung stabs him in the gut. Do Il kicks him in the face, sending him flying overboard, and jumps out after him into the black ocean waves below. That makes 13 victims down, with only one survivor left. The next morning, Joel walks ashore onto a trash-strewn beach. He wades out of the water exhausted, but still alive. He's managed to escape, and now his quest for revenge can continue. But what do you think? How would you be Project Wolf Hunting? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe. Check out the Hounds of Bee playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.